Thank you. So I shall be covering a clinical review of Duraverine. These are my disclosures. And this is what I've been asked to cover. Recent clinical trials and highlighting potential clinical relevance. Now you've already heard some excellent talks that will have covered Duraverine today. The role of reverse transcriptase inhibitors in curtailing the HIV epidemic, mechanisms of action and clinical pharmacology. So I shall do my best to avoid too much detail on those. However, I will start with this. Certainly in the UK, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor class is one we have long loved. And it's a class we've been using since the late 1990s. It's a class we're very familiar with, and therefore it's a class that remains very important in treatment today. This map I actually found by Googling Brexit and Europe map, but it could also reflect the patterns of prescribing in the 2000s. The UK had long preferred NNRTIs over protease inhibitors, whereas much of Europe, though not exclusively, tended to prefer PIs. And the reasons were the following. Earlier NNRTIs were arguably better tolerated than early proteases. Convenience in terms of dosing and pill burden, Interactions, and though first-generation non-nukes in particular associated with drug interactions, of course, arguably fewer than with proteases. And efficacy, and that was actually proven in the ACTG5142 study, which showed if favorins with a 2-NRTI backbone to be superior to 2-NRTIs with lapinavir, ritonavir. The other issue is that NNRTIs are a class that has never been associated with an excess risk of cardiovascular disease, and that's for the class as a whole, as well as individual agents. But of course, there were issues, and as we know, nevirapine was limited by severe hypersensitivity reactions, which manifested with cutaneous or hepatic features, although once someone's established on it, it has an excellent profile. However, this has largely meant nevirapine is very rarely started today. Ifavirin is a drug which, of course, is still widely used globally, also associated with rash and hepatotoxicity, though to a lesser degree than nevirapine. But of course, that hallmark adverse event of neuropsychiatric symptoms, which is thought to be due to direct neuronal toxicity. Hyperlipidemia is common with ifavirins, though, as I noted, this has not been associated with excess cardiovascular risk in big cohorts. The other issue is the genetic barrier. Now, nevirapine and ifavirins have long half lives so to a degree, they're quite forgiving, but both where virologic failure occurs, commonly associated with NNRTI resistance emergence. The second generation, itravirine, was also associated with rash, and like nevirapine, this was more common in females. Transaminitis was also common, though rarely severe, but itravirine re never really established itself and was largely used in salvage or treatment experienced situations. Then rilpivirine, and in terms of rash and transaminitis, generally doing much better, fairly lipid neutral, and arguably no real signature toxicity, but of course, as we know, it has a low barrier to resistance. So then the third generation NNRTI Duraferine and the focus of this talk. And Duraferine, as you will have seen earlier, has a unique structure, very different to the other drugs in this class. Thinking about issues like rash and liver toxicity, rash is less common. So in driver head against efavirins, you can see lower rates of rash and no rash related discontinuations. And in terms of liver toxicity, the liver tox database shows there's been no clinical hepatotoxicity reports and the descriptions of transaminitis are usually mild and transient. And then this lipid profile, green for duraverine with a TDF and lamivudine backbone and gray for efavirins with emtricitabine and TDF. And you can see this really optimal lipid profile with a reduction in most parameters. <laughs> 
Now on the topic of liver toxicity, I just want to highlight that it's not necessarily straightforward when comparing different drugs. This is a review that was published earlier this year and they've summarized the hepatotoxicity with different NNRTIs in clinical trials. Now here we see the efavirin studies. I won't go into detail, but you can see here they're looking at mainly grade three and four transaminitis. But importantly, if the far right column, if you look at that, you can see differences in the rate of viral hepatitis co-infection. So the top study, for example, 40% of those participants also living with hepatitis C. Here is real piverine, and you can see here some variation in the endpoints described and much lower rates of hepatitis B or C co-infection. And finally, giraffarine. And again, here we're seeing some differences in the endpoints reported. And this is what makes it very challenging to compare different NNRTIs. Over the years, the baseline characteristics of the studied populations will differ viral hepatitis I've highlighted, but also the stage of HIV in terms of viral load and CD4, which we know can influence the risk of toxicity. Trials may differ in terms of which concomitant medications are permitted. Other antiretroviral components, we know that NRTIs differ in their propensity to cause hepatotoxicity. The monitoring and stopping rules within trials and also the endpoints, as I've illustrated, that get reported. The other challenge is if you look at the summaries of product characteristics for the different NNRTIs, they all report different levels of detail. Now, coming back to Dravarine specifically and thinking about the genetic barrier for NNRTIs, drive forward where Dravarine was compared first line with boosted darunavir, there was no emergent NNRTI or NRTI resistance. And when these results came out, we were hopeful that we would see a high barrier NNRTI. However, in drive ahead, where it was head to head first line also, but against efavirenz, you can see there was some NNRTI and NRTI resistance emergence amongst the admittedly small number of virologic failures. And here you could argue there is a lower rate of NNRTI resistance compared to efavirenz. If we compare it, as I mentioned, to real piverine, which particularly has a low barrier to resistance, if we look at the STAR study, we can see amongst the virologic failures that NNN, NNRTI and NRTI resistance was more common, 4% of the whole study population compared to just below 2% and 1.5% for NNRTI and NRTI resistance emergence in driver head in the deraverine arm. Drug-drug interactions, I won't dwell on this particularly, but I mentioned earlier, NNRTIs can be associated with numerous drug-drug interactions, though arguably not as much as the boosted drugs in the top left. If you look at the bottom right for Duravarine, you can see not only does it have a more green profile compared to other NNRTIs, it's very similar to the unboosted integrases. So we could argue that Duravarine is the optimal NNRTI as the latest evolution of this class. But of course, the battle it's not really undertaken, certainly not directly, is against integrase inhibitors. And as you all know, the European and US guidelines prefer integrase inhibitors for first line therapy. Now, certainly it's got a very good neuropsychiatric profile, and this is something that has been associated with the integrases in cohorts and clinical trials. And this is data from Drive Ahead again, and we can see significantly lower rates of dizziness, sleep disorder, and altered sensorium for Duravarine compared to efavirenz. Now, looking at Drive Ahead in more detail and some of the longer term results, as you can see, head to head, Duravarine versus efavirenz, and at week 96, the Duravarine arm continued and the efavirenz arm switched to Duravarine. In terms of drug-related adverse events, these were less common during the extension. There were no serious drug-related adverse events during the extension. And remember, this includes people who are switching to Duravarine for the first time. And we can see in the table how low the rates of these issues were. The lipids is interesting, and I've already shown you earlier on the optimal lipid profile for Duravarine. And what we see here from week 96 on the left, people who continued Duravarine TDF and lamivudine, really little change in their lipids. 
Those who switched to Doravarine rather than stayed on ephaphrins in the green, you can see an improvement in their lipid profile. And what about weight? Of course, weight has been a hot topic and the drugs particularly associated with possible excess weight gain are TAF, tenofovir allophenamide, and the second generation integrase inhibitors. We already know doravarine appears to be associated with numerically less weight gain in first line studies than the second generation integrases, but of course it's been studied primarily with a TDF backbone and with the hypothesis that TDF may be associated with relative weight loss, this may give doravarine an advantage. However, if Favarins is another drug that's been mooted to be associated with relative weight loss, and actually what we see here, looking at weight change, and if you look particularly at the first 96 weeks, the gray line for Favarins and the green line for Doravarine are very similar, suggesting that Doravarine does not cause excess weight gain, certainly relative to Favarins. And this may be a particular advantage for this regimen. We need to know more. Then same day art. Now, anyone who's seen me present on this will know that I am slightly skeptical about the evidence base for same day art. I strongly support patient choice, but certainly in high income settings, it's hard to argue there is strong evidence that same day art yields better outcomes. Hence this illustration from the fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. Having said that, if you are offering same day art, would you be able to use Doravarine based therapy? Now there's no trials to support this, though the trials for same day art are very limited. But if we look, for example, at this zero converter study from Germany, what this shows us is the rate of doravarine resistance that's been transmitted is very low. So if you count all the different NNRTI mutations reported in this study, a maximum 0.4% of people would have doravarine resistance, suggesting this drug certainly could play a role if you're starting treatment before you have resistance tests available, though again, there's no trial data to support this. The other thing about Doravarine is the flexibility. Now, of course, we have the fixed dose three drug combination with a TDF and lamivudine backbone, but we also have the option to use it more flexibly because we can use it as a single agent. And that, of course, opens up the options for exploring things like two drug regimens. Now, it's amazing that we're looking at two drug regimens. I think it's fair to say Viva has been slightly lonely at the two drug regimen party, and it's very good that MSD has joined with some of the studies I shall move on to shortly. Certainly, of course, Gilead is on the way, perhaps in, a, in an Uber. MSD is knocking at the door of the party and Gilead is in a taxi en route. And just touching on some of the Gilead planned work, this is the Calibrate study. We saw results at the IAS conference out to week 28. The phase I'm particularly interested in, and this is looking at Lena Kapavir in various permutations against a BIC FTC and TAF control arm. But this is the phase I'm particularly interested in when they're looking at Lena Kapavir with TAF or Lena Kapavir with BIC Tegravir. And of course, MSD and Gilead have announced they're going to be working together, looking at long acting art. And here they'll be looking at Lena Kapavir and Is Latravir, which is great news. Coming back to Doravarine in the context of two drug regimens, this is the protocol 011. And this is looking at Is Latravir with Doravarine compared to Doravarine Lamivudine TDF. And we've seen results to week 96, which showed no major efficacy differences, supporting Islatravir and Doravarine as a two drug regimen. This is a phase two study. We must be cautious about drawing any major conclusions from arms with only 30 participants. But the other thing to look at is weight change. And this is looking at the spread of weight change over time, gray for the TDF containing arm and those various shades of green for Islatravir and Doravarine. And what we're seeing is fairly similar weight change. So here, Doravarine, even in the absence of that perhaps weight suppressive TDF, when combined with Islatravir, you don't seem to be seeing any major weight differences. And the same was observed with peripheral and trunk fat. So the changes you're seeing with Islatravir Doravarine are similar to TDF Lamivudine Doravarine. So really supporting that this, this NNRTI appears to be quite optimal from a metabolic perspective. Active. 
On the far right, we're looking at total cholesterol to HDL ratio, which is the lipid parameter that goes into the cardiovascular risk calculator that we use in the UK. And here, actually, you're seeing improvements in that ratio with these latrovid deraferine arms. So I think quite an interesting two-drug regimen from a metabolic perspective. So what next? And here are some of my pieces of advice for where we should be going next. Now, this is to illustrate scraping the bottom of the barrel. And I think we really need to be careful to not be picking around and using tenuous endpoints that haven't been associated with clinical outcomes when we're debating the differences between drugs. They are important, but I do think some of the narrative around inflammatory markers, particularly in the context of two versus three drug regimens, risks being unhelpful. Therefore, we should be focusing on patient reported outcome measures. We are seeing these emerging as important endpoints in clinical trials, but those endpoints that are important to people taking the drugs and living with HIV really must become the focus. We really need, of course, to be getting more data in understudied populations sooner, for example, children, for example, pregnant women. And we must be thinking about cost. And it's not just the cost of the drugs. When we're thinking about long acting, it's also the cost of implementation. And that's where this implementa implementation science field is so, so important in illustrating what will the impact of new developments be on services. And then we can truly work out the costs relative to the benefits to patients. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for your kind attention.